Hello and welcome to Culture Vulture number six, where I'm looking at Out of Our Heads by Alvin Noe. Why you are not your brain and other lessons from the biology of consciousness. And I'm looking at how this informs us about what is culture and uh, why consciousness might be an important part of that. So what does Alvin Noe tell us? Well, as the subtitle suggests, we are not merely our brains. And he writes persuasively in this book, I think, that consciousness requires the joint operation of brain, body and world. World being environment, the social, the cultural milieu around us. Now, Noe sees this as challenging what he sees as a almost Cartesian orthodoxy of neuroscience in that neuroscience, not seeing a spirit in the head, certainly sees the brain as some sort of magical doer of all things. So, so instead of a spirit, he, he kind of says, well, this is also a Cartesian way of looking at the world. It's just expanded from a spirit inside the brain to the brain itself. So consciousness doesn't exist, he thinks, inside the darkness of the skull. Rather, consciousness is something we do. It's active. Now, one of the ways he describes this is consciousness is more like dancing than it is like digestion. So consciousness is not just stuff coming in and it can't be seen if we if we take the brain apart we can't see consciousness and we can't understand consciousness by just looking at the brain either so no matter how many mri scans you get you know and these are the neural correlates of consciousness all those sorts of things he suggests that's just the same as looking at muscles trying to understand dance and of course you want to understand dance well you've got to think of the body what it's dancing to the space it's dancing in who it's dancing with the feeling inside yes the the musculature yes the skeletal uh, frame yes but also all those other things the external because dance doesn't exist without that and of course, it also has the communicative aspects with an audience watching it, plus the whole tradition of dance and music over the centuries, if you like, where, where these things have come from. So I'll, it's, it's more, and I'll, I think that a lot of this draws on Heidegger. So I'm going to use the idea, the Heideggerian um, idea of being in the world. Our minds are formed by body, world, brain. Now, those materialists who focus on cells to explain mind get short shrift in this book. Noe says we need to turn away from individual neurons, suggesting you can no more explain mind in terms of the cell than you can explain dance in terms of the muscle there. The question about what consciousness is none other than the problem of life so if we want to look at consciousness we've got to think of it as part of the whole part of life mind is life he says and if we want to understand life we don't just look inwards we also look to well i th think of an example but yeah the mountain goat well its name implies that we have to look at more than just goat and what's inside the goat you think of the mountain goat is situated on the mountain why that's important giraffe why the long neck yeah sounds like something to do with a joke but um you've got to understand it in terms of the environment it's in and the same with consciousness so consciousness is not something that's in there it's a consciousness that's conscious of and how we are conscious of and how the mind is external to the brain is is extraordinarily important just as trying to understand the neck of the giraffe completely take it away from anything to do with the world in which it's in might be problematic 
So if we want to understand life, we don't just look inwards, we also look to how an animal lives, how it's socialized, and how it is wrapped up in its place. That's the way he puts it. It's wrapped up in its place. And for Noe, it's the brain's job. So the brain does have a very important role within this. It's to facilitate the interactions between brain, body, world. And of course, that makes experience central. But what makes experience what it is, is not the brain on its own. It's the world and our relation to it that matters. And the brain coordinates our dealings with the environment embodied and situated. Meaning the world is part of a dynamical consciousness. Now our bodies also give a structure and shape to our relationship to the environment and the world. And he uses a phrase in the book quite a lot that the world shows up for us. Now, not only that, but we also access it as well. So it's a two way process. The world is there and it's showing up for us, but we access it just as if I want to access the world over that way, over there, I'm going to access it by looking and the world makes itself available to me there. And if I want to then look over there, I access that and the world shows itself out. If I wanted to, I could go outside the door and see the world beyond and I know it's out there. So, you know, I'm accessing those things that are around me and it, the, the environment around me is showing up for us. So he likens the brain also to a musical instrument. Now, all that accessing things like that is not my brain on its own. A musical instrument can't play itself. And he's suggesting that the brain can't think for itself. We need to look just in there for thoughts and, and consciousness, we won't find it. Now for him, there is no boundary at our skull or skin. There is, it's not here. The mind is external as well as internal. And the way he, one of the ways he puts this is we are involved, that is to say, tangled up with the places we find ourselves. So the mind is tangled up in the world. It is, well, the mind doesn't exist without the world. So uh, another way of putting this very clearly um, and, and, and to underline the non-Cartesian nature of this, our body is not a machine that carries the brain. Now, the environment in which we find ourselves enables us to find our way around it. Now, if you go outside, if I go out into the world, by the way, is over there. If I go out into the world over there, I just know, well, am I going to walk in the middle of the road? Am I going to walk on the pavement? The, there are things culturally situated as I am in time as well as place. I know that the pavement is the place for me, perhaps unless I'm going to cross the road, I've got to look left and right and all these other things. It's a type of enculturation. It's a physical and a social cultural environment. The world involves us and we are involved in it. Now the world isn't contained within us, memorized. We've extended this world thanks to technology and our use of tools and our cultural practices, all these things. And it's not due to individual proclivity, but something which comes to us from the great cultural advances and traditions into which we find ourselves, as Heidegger would say, find ourselves flung. Meaning surrounds us. We have an active relationship with it. We are involved in the world. Now, for the intellectual man, and, and um, no way, is the pains to say that the problems with the intellectual man or the, the, the materialist or the physicalist perhaps, the world shows up as strange and objectified, something to be figured out and analyzed, he says. But our relationship to the world is always in the midst of things. We are subjective. Now, this of course, doesn't mean that we can't have a more objective view 
or that everything is relative or, or anything like that but it is a fact that you're watching this now and whatever's going on your thoughts are responding to this from in, in a subjective way you are looking at it as being involved in it and you might be involved in a disparaging way or a yay sort of way i don't know now he also talks and this is very important for educators of course the, the move from novice to expert and he suggests we don't exist as novices in our environment you know we become experts in the environments in which we find ourselves we are not biological computers detached from the world we are hab habituated we are at home in our environment and something we understand most particularly if we if our lives are ruptured in in any way and we have to get used to being in a different world now the the examples he gives of that are things like moving from one culture to another culture um, that's very foreign to you and having to um, find your way around that culture or perhaps now this was written a few years ago if it had been written today he might say that here we are how lockdown has affected us and how we have to find our way in a different world and how we have to sort of come quite quickly expert in being a meter or two meters away from all those who we pass on the pavement and these, these different cultural clues we're getting around us as someone comes up to us we have this sort of standoff mexican standoff perhaps so uh, you know i'm going to pass or you're going to pass i'm going to pass. like like uh, two uh, Commedia dell'arte captains meeting on a bridge, you know, we're going to have a, some sort of struggle to get past each other. But anyway, um, I digress. But it's this shared understanding of the world, the, the culture that enables us to communicate. Okay, so even, even the avant-garde artist has to cope with this because someone who's avant-garde, if they are so far out, completely out from all tradition all cultural things that have happened before if they're so far out on the limb then they they will not be understood at all because we need some sort of thing to get we are expert in in order for the avant-garde artist to sort of break against the tradition and and move it a slight way to get to get us so we can go with that and say, oh that's a bit weird rather than no comprehension at all so the way he puts this the challenge faced by an artist is to make something new that is comprehensible and to be comprehensible it must already be in a way partly old and then he adds in fact this is the quandary we face in every aspect of our lives now our consciousness of the world <laughs> the way we relate to it our minds all this sort of stuff are shaped by the culture the society around us and the ways of seeing that we we become used to the ways of hearing the ways of thinking the whole thing and therefore to push against that boundary is fine to take us to the edge of that boundary is fine and then to step over the edge is absolutely fine but to be completely in a different but we will we have no way of comprehending our minds do not stretch to something beyond all these things that have been made around us so it's almost the, the importance of the way things have always been done in order to take us to the point where we want to push against that but if we start from a completely different place making up a completely new language and i know this is something antonio and i told this the theatre director the theatre maker practitioner wanted to do is just completely break down everything by creating something completely new and of course everyone thought he was mad and and some of the things he was doing perhaps were ahead of its time but some of the things that you know are just completely incomprehensible to people then and and probably now as well so this is the, uh, another way of putting it we first go to the limits of what is known and then we can push the boundaries the world as it presents itself 
to us in our time that fixes the nature of conscious experience. So the world as it presents itself to us in our time fixes the nature of conscious experience. So brain, world, body, us in the world, the brain re helping us react to things out there. That, that's, that's it, it's involved. So he underlines this, the brain is not a computer. It's not an information processor. And he argues that this metaphor has no relevance at all to human cognition. What gives my thoughts, our thoughts, what gives my thoughts their content is my involvement with the world. Meaning is out there. World provides meaning, as he says. And again, brain is not on its own the source of cognition. And therefore, mind is not the brain's software either. Which means the thing within us, whether Cartesian soul or neo-Cartesian brain that thinks and feels, is not the metaphor that you can use with this. Why think alone that the brain is all that's needed? You know, why the brain alone? And, and he goes the whole thing about brain in a vat and argues against those 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 ideas that the brain can exist and create the world around it you know as though though it's got something you can't even go and this goes goes back to the book i looked at last time this, this whole thing about the brain as something which has something we can look at as separate to world is, is something we can't ever do because we're all part of the world you know but but to imagine a brain completely on its own living in a vat as though that makes some sort of sense it just wouldn't understand anything about its own in fact it wouldn't work it, it, it would have probably arguably no consciousness whatsoever so then you add the nervous system so the brain and the nervous system you think well you no, know, it still hasn't got any existence so then people then start talking but we could wire it up to some sort of computers with with various inputs to it and things like that in other words you create an environment for it so there you go in order to understand the brain the brain needs a body the nervous system and and then the senses around it and then it needs an environment that you would need to build around it and all, all those other things to, to give it some sort of sense of what's going on. So in other words, even then, the brain in a vat experiment that you take through the, the thought experiment, you end up putting it in an environment, in a body, a type of body, and in an environment. And he says that the, the, the problem with people who are devising robots and and to to get to and, and with with brains you know that we're going to get to a certain point because they keep adding 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 all these electronic things to it at some point consciousness will emerge they say but it's not consciousness of anything consciousness if you can build it it has to be aware of the world it's in so you'll have to not just create an artificial brain you have to have an artificial body to put that brain in and an artificial environment around it for it to appreciate where it is and if you're going to do that then why make it artificial why not have it aware of the environment in which we are in and it's that looking seeing feeling being and absorbing culture as it is the social world as it is the environment around us we are conscious of this world around us and that's where consciousness comes from culture is an essential part of consciousness of mind of the way we think and of course without it what would we be thinking about thank you <laughs>